Today we'll be talking about nutrition, exercise, and sports. Exercise is essential to good health, but people get generally less than recommended. And so the majority of our health problems, specifically here in the United States, is from a lack of exercise. Around one half or 50% of adults exercise at least 30 minutes per day, but 40% of our population has no physical activity every single day. The benefits of regular physical activity include enhanced heart function, improved balance, a reduced risk of falling, better sleep habits, healthier body composition, which means more lean muscle mass and less adipose tissue or fat tissue, reduced injury to muscles, tendons, and joints. Engaging in physical activity can also reduce stress and lower blood pressure and blood cholesterol levels, contribute to blood glucose regulation and immune function. Physical activity helps in weight loss efforts by raising resting energy expenditure. Healthy People 2020 objectives for U.S. adults include to reduce the proportion of adults engaging in no leisure time physical activity and increasing the proportion of adults who meet current federal physical activity guidelines for aerobic and muscle strengthening activities. The physical activity guidelines for Americans set three goals for physical activity. Adults should be physically active. Each week, adults should engage in 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity. Note that the recommendations are in total minutes and not in days of the week and minutes per day. Instead, you are given a recommendation of minutes per week and allowed to complete them whenever the person is able to. And the last goal is to perform muscle strengthening activities two or more days each week. A good fitness program meets a person's needs, so that means that an ideal program for each individual is going to be different. What one person enjoys, another may not enjoy. The first step to find a good fitness program is to define goals. So is your person training for an athletic competition? Are they wanting to lose weight? Are they wanting to improve their balance, increase stamina? There are many reasons why someone wants to become physically active, and the first step is always to define that individual's goals. So if we're talking about a good fitness program, the mode is referring to the type of exercise performed. The American College of Sports Medicine defines aerobic exercise as any activity that uses large muscle groups can be maintained continuously and is rhythmic in nature. It is a type of exercise that causes the heart and lungs to work harder than at rest. Aerobic exercise includes activities such as brisk walking, running, lap swimming, and cycling. Resistance exercise, or strength training, is defined as activities that use muscular strength to move a weight or work against a resistant load. Flexibility exercise is a type of exercise that increases the ability of a joint to move through its entire range of motion. The duration is the amount of time spent in an exercise. Generally, exercise should last about 30 minutes, which, is, which does not include warm-up and cool-down periods. Frequency is the number of times a week that you are physically active. Intensity is the level of effort required or how hard the exercise is to perform. Low intensity is a very mild increased heart rate exercise. Moderate intensity is when your breathing, sweating, and heart rate increases, but you can still carry a conversation. And vigorous intensity is when your breathing, sweating, and heart rate increases, and it is difficult to carry a conversation. Progression is the duration, frequency, and intensity of exercise over time. Consistency is when you make exercise a part of your daily routine. You need variety in your exercise routine so that you do not become bored with the routine. Achievement and maintenance is starting where you are at and building up your endurance level. This is the best way to maintain your fitness level. Heart rate has been used to define intensity. This is a popular and simple method that uses a formula 220 minus their age in years to determine their maximum heart rate. The range of heart rates between 60% and 90% of maximum is called the target zone. To utilize the chemical energy in foods, body cells must first convert the energy in foods to ATP. When the body uses energy, one of the phosphates from ATP is cleaved off to have energy released. A resting muscle cell contains only a small amount of ATP, which can keep the muscle working for one to two seconds. 
To produce more ATP for muscle contraction, the body uses phosphocreatine, or also known as PCR. Dietary carbohydrates, protein, and fat are also used as energy sources. Phosphocreatine is a high-energy compound created from ATP and creatine and is stored in small amounts in muscle cells. Creatine is an organic molecule in muscle cells that is synthesized from three amino acids, glycine, arginine, and methionine. It can also be provided from supplements. When ADP accumulates, an enzyme is activated and transfers a high-energy phosphate from phosphocreatine to ADP to form ATP. This can maintain maximal muscle contractions for about 10 seconds, upwards of one minute. The advantage of PCR is that it can be activated instantly and replenish ATP quickly enough to meet energy demands of the fastest and most powerful sport events like jumping, throwing, lifting, and sprinting. A disadvantage is that too little is made and stored in muscles to sustain a high rate of ATP resupply for more than a few minutes. We learned in digestion and absorption that glucose breaks down during glycolysis to form a three-carbon molecule called pyruvate. This process does not require oxygen and only produces small amounts of ATP. If oxygen is present, then pyruvate is metabolized further, which produces much more ATP. When the oxygen supply is limited in an anaerobic state, or when physical activity is intense, pyruvate from glycolysis accumulates in the muscle and forms lactate. The breakdown of one glucose molecule yields two ATP, and glycolysis can supply some ATP depleted in muscle activity. Carbohydrate is the only fuel that can be used for this process. Glycolysis provides most of the energy for sports events in which energy production is near maximal for 30 to 120 seconds. The disadvantages of this pathway is that it cannot sustain ATP production for long, and only about 5% of the total ATP production from muscle glycogen can be released. The rapid accumulation of lactate from anaerobic glycolysis may be associated with the onset of fatigue. The lactate that is built up in the muscles eventually gets released into the bloodstream. The heart can use lactate directly for its energy needs and the liver takes up some lactate from the blood and resynthesizes it into glucose using an energy requiring process. The aerobic pathway is used when oxygen is available and physical activity is being completed at a moderate to low intensity. About 95% of the ATP produced from the complete metabolism of glucose is formed aerobically. This process is much slower than the anaerobic pathway but produces much more energy and is the main energy contributor for activities that are lasting two minutes to three hours or longer. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in the liver and muscles. The liver glycogen is used to maintain blood glucose levels and muscle glycogen supplies glucose to working muscle and is used for short events. When muscle glycogen declines, muscles begin to take up blood glucose for energy. When glycogen stores are exhausted, a person can only work at 50% of maximal capacity, which is known as hitting the wall. For exercise that requires 70% or more of maximal effort for more than an hour, athletes should consider increasing the amount of carbohydrates stored in their muscles. This is done by eating a diet high in carbohydrates so that their muscle glycogen stores are increased, which can delay the onset of fatigue. This is known as carbohydrate loading. Fat is the predominant fuel source when at rest and during prolonged exercise, especially when exercise remains at a low or moderate aerobic rate. During lengthy activities such as a triathlon, an ultramarathon, occupations requiring labor, or even work at a desk for 8 hours a day uses fat for 50 to 90% of the energy required. The rate at which muscles use fatty acids is affected by training level. Training allows an athlete to use fat for fuel more readily, thereby conserving glycogen for when it is really needed, such as a burst at the end of a race. The advantage of using fat over other energy sources is that fat provides more than twice as much energy and more ATP. There is plenty of fat stored in the body compared with the very limited carbohydrate stores. The disadvantages is that fat is not metabolized as efficiently as carbohydrates, and it cannot support intense or anaerobic activities. Fat utilization cannot occur fast enough 
to meet the ATP demands of short duration, high intensity physical activity. Most of the energy supplied from protein comes from the metabolism of the branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. These amino acids can be used to make glucose, or they can enter the citrate acid cycle as precursors to glucose and provide energy during exercise. Amino acids contribute a relatively small amount towards making fuel for muscles. Only 5% of the body's general energy needs come from protein during exercise. During endurance events, up to 15% of energy can come from protein. The most pronounced effects from physical activity are seen in the muscular system, circulatory system, and the skeletal system. Skeletal muscle is composed of three main types of muscle fibers. Type 1, also known as slow twitch, these muscle fibers contract slowly and have a high capacity for oxidative metabolism. They are also called red fibers because of their high myoglobin content. They are fueled by the aerobic respiration of fat. We have type 2A, which are also known as fast twitch. These muscle fibers have moderate oxidative capacity and are fueled by glycolysis using glucose, plus the aerobic respiration of both fat and glucose. Type 2X, also known as fat, fast twitch, these muscle fibers have less oxidative capacity than other muscle fibers. They are also called white fibers because they have less mitochondria and myoglobin than the other fibers. This type of muscle fiber is fueled by glycolysis using glucose. The proportions of the three fiber types throughout the muscles of the body vary from person to person and are constant throughout each person's life. However, some shifting in the proportions of fiber types can occur with training and aging. The individual differences in fiber type distribution are partially responsible for producing elite marathon runners who could never compete at the same level as sprinters or elite gymnasts. Although the proportion of muscle fiber types is largely determined by genetics, training can develop muscles within those limits. Training matches the muscle strength to work demands. The term hypertrophy is when the muscles become enlarged because they are made to work repeatedly. So if you're working out a lot, your muscles are in hypertrophy. They are becoming larger. Atrophy is the loss of muscle size and strength due to inactivity. So if you were exercising a lot and suddenly you stop for a long period of time, your muscles would be in atrophy because they're losing muscle size and strength because you're not using them. Aerobic exercise benefits the circulatory system by producing more red blood cells, increasing your blood volume, increasing the number of capillaries in your muscle tissue, and strengthening your heart muscle. Bone density also increases with weight-bearing exercises. If we're looking at the energy needs and the food sources for athletes, athletes experience fatigue or weight loss, then their food consumption should be considered. So they should maintain weight during competition and training. If they need to lose weight, decrease food intake by 200 to 500 calories. If they need to gain weight, you can increase their food intake by 500 to 700 calories. If we look at the carbohydrate needs of athletes, if they're exercising vigorously for one or more hours, then carbohydrate consumption needs to be moderate to high as fuel needs have to match training and glycogen stores. For low intensity activity, carbohydrate intake should range from three to five grams per kilogram. For moderate intensity, carbohydrate intake should be from 5 to 7 grams per kilogram. And if exercising for several hours a day, carbohydrate intake should range from 6 to 10 grams per kilogram. To boost the glycogen stores during exercise exceeding 90 minutes, those muscle glycogen stores are going to significantly decline. There also may be a gradual decline occurring over repeated days of heavy training. So to maximize the body's ability to store glycogen, the following carbohydrate loading, loading regimen should be followed. So tapering off training intensity and duration six days prior to competition and following a high carbohydrate diet for three days before competition. Remember, a few slides back, we talked about carbohydrate loading. That's what these individuals are doing to boost their glycogen stores. 
If we look at fat needs, intake should be 15 to 25 percent of their total calories per day. Unsaturated fat is emphasized, and saturated fat and trans fat should be limited. So they're following the same recommendations for saturated fat and trans fat as the general public. Protein needs for athletes is 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram. And if you recall, the general population's protein recommendations is 0.8 grams per kilogram. So this is almost double the general population. And they need this higher protein intake for the repair of tissue and the synthesis of new muscle. Remember, protein is not a major fuel source for exercise. Protein intakes above these recommendations result in an increased use of amino acids for energy needs and has disadvantages such as insufficient carbohydrate intake and increased urine production, which may interfere with body hydration. There's no advantages such as an increase in muscle protein synthesis. Athletes have the same or slightly higher vitamin and mineral needs because they have a higher energy intake and tend to consume enough. The exception is athletes that are on low calorie diets, so 1200 calories or less, who may need to consume fortified foods or a balanced multivitamin and mineral supplement, specifically for the B vitamins. Iron is involved in red blood cell production, oxygen transport, and energy production. A deficiency of this mineral can noticeably detract from optimal athletic performance. And the potential causes for iron deficiency in athletes vary. In the general population, female athletes are more susceptible to low iron status due to monthly menstrual losses. Special diets followed by athletes, such as low energy and vegetarian diets, are likely to be low in iron. Distance runners should pay special attention to iron intake because the, their intense workouts may lead to gastrointestinal bleeding. Another concern is sports anemia, which occurs because exercise causes blood plasma volume to expand, particularly at the start of a training regimen before the synthesis of red blood cells increases. This expansion results in the dilution of the blood. In sports anemia, even if iron stores are adequate, blood iron tests may appear low. Sports anemia is not detrimental to performance, but it is very difficult to differentiate between sports anemia and true anemia. Intake of milk and dairy products may lead to low intakes of calcium, which compromises bone health for athletes. There's a term called the female athlete triad, and this consists of menstrual disturbances, amnorrhea, and amnorrhea is when a woman does not have a menstrual cycle. They also have an energy deficient or disordered eating and bone loss or osteoporosis. If we're talking about the fluid needs for active individuals, active individuals need more fluids than those who are sedentary to replace the fluid lost in sweat and thereby maintain blood volume and allow the body to regulate internal temperature normally. Heat exhaustion and heat stroke are on a continuum. Heat exhaustion is the first stage of heat-related illness caused by dehydration. Common symptoms of heat exhaustion include profuse sweating, headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, muscle weakness, visual disturbances, and flushing of the skin. This person should be taken into a cool environment and excess clothing removed. Heat cramps are a frequent complication of heat exhaustion, but they may appear without other symptoms of dehydration. Heat cramps occur in skeletal muscles and consist of contractions lasting one to three minutes at a time. The cramp moves down the muscle and causes excruciating pain. It's important not to confuse heat cramps with other forms of muscle cramps, such as those caused by intestinal tract upset. To prevent this, start with moderate exercise, have an adequate salt intake, and avoid becoming dehydrated. When heat exhaustion is left unchecked, it can rapidly progress to heat stroke. And this can occur when the internal body temperature reaches 104 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Symptoms include nausea, confusion, irritability, poor coordination, seizures, hot and dry skin, rapid heart rate, vomiting, diarrhea, and coma. If heat stroke is left untreated, circulatory collapse, nervous system damage, and death are likely. 
the death rate from heat stroke is about 10%. For heat stroke victims, cooling the skin with ice packs or cold water is the recommendation for immediate treatment until medical help can arrive. To measure fluid intake and replacement strategies, athletes should weigh in before and after exercise, and it is not recommended to lose more than 2% of body weight. For every pound lost, three cups of fluid should be consumed. If one cannot monitor weight change, you can assess the urine color, it should be no darker than lemonade. Thirst is a late sign of dehydration, and it's not a reliable indicator of the need to replace fluid. Recommendations for fluid intake before exercise is to freely drink beverages 24 hours before an event. Drink two to three cups two to three hours before an event. Drink one to one and a half cups 10 to 15 minutes prior to an event. During exercise, drink one to one and a half cups every 10 to 15 minutes. Drink enough to maintain your weight. If more than one hour, replacement beverages should contain 4 to 8% carbohydrates and 0.5 to 0.7 grams of sodium per liter. After exercise, drink three cups for each pound lost and restore weight before the next exercise period. Water intoxication is most often caused by over drinking without replacing sodium losses. So you can prevent this by drinking beverages that contain sodium, consuming enough fluid during exercise to minimize the loss of weight, and consuming sports drinks with 100 milligrams of sodium per 8 ounce serving. Sports drinks like Powerade and Gatorade are more important for events lasting longer than 60 minutes because they supply glucose to muscles as they become depleted, which can enhance performance. They also provide electrolytes to help maintain blood volume, enhance absorption of water and carbohydrates, and stimulate thirst. Athletes should avoid beverages with alcohol, caffeine, carbonation, and sugar content above 10%. A pre-exercise meal keeps an athlete from feeling hunger before and during their event. It maintains optimal blood glucose levels and improves performance. The pre-exercise meal should be high in carbohydrates, so 4 grams per kilogram, 3.5 to 4 hours before an event, and 1 gram per kilogram 1 hour before an event. The meal should be non-greasy because it can cause intestinal upset, and less than 20% of calorie intake close to the event. You want food that's not going to produce gas and is readily digestible. For events that are lasting longer than 1 hour, athletes should consume 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour, some popular choices are sports drinks with 6 to 8% carbohydrates, carbohydrate gels with 25 grams of carbohydrate per serving, and energy bars with 40 grams of carbohydrate, but no more than 10 grams of protein, 4 grams of fat, and 5 grams of fiber. Recovery meals should promote protein synthesis and reloading of glycogen stores. So athletes should consume 1 to 1.5 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram within 30 minutes of exercise and at 2 hour intervals. The cells are more sensitive to insulin immediately after exercise and a high glycemic load food works best. And eat small amount of protein with carbohydrate. The best recovery meal is honestly chocolate milk like chocolate skim milk. Ergogenic aids is a substance or treatment intended to improve exercise performance. Most of them are ineffective and some of them are dangerous. You need scientific support for an abundant carbohydrates, healthy, varied diet, and caffeine.